Travellers, druids and hippies are joining forces to stage an organised festival at Stonehenge to celebrate the summer solstice. They formed a Stonehenge campaign to press for legal access to the monument in an attempt to avoid the violence of previous years when gatherings at the stones have been banned. Campaign organisers say it's an issue of international freedom. Chris Wilson reports. In recent years, virtually the only people to witness this spectacle have been officers from Wiltshire Police Force. The summer solstice at Stonehenge, traditionally a spiritual occasion, has been marred by violence and bloody confrontation since annual celebrations were banned in 1985. For thousands of people, the stones are a meeting place. The June solstice, a vital part of their year. They believe the ban's a blatant abuse of human rights. Today, new moves to gain legal access to the stones were announced at a press conference in London. The Stonehenge campaign claim it is possible to stage peaceful and legal celebrations. There's no reason at all why it shouldn't be possible to have a really amazing event organised at Stonehenge that would be a credit to the country, a credit to the people who helped to set it up and a credit to the people who go there. It must be possible. The Grand Council of British Druids claim they have legal rights to hold an Eisteddfod at the Stones. They also support the travellers in their demands for permission to stage an annual festival. We welcome all people of uh, any disposition who wants to come peaceably, whether they uh, wear a suit and have short hair or, or whether they don't. Um, so anyone who, who's prepared to come in peace is, is always welcome, be they travellers or whoever. A series of events and demonstrations are planned to draw attention to the campaign. Protests will be staged both in this country and abroad. Public meetings being held in Winchester next month and moves are being made to have the case heard in the European court. Meanwhile, preparations are already underway for this year's solstice. June the 21st has been designated National Nude Day and among the planned spiritual events is what's described as mass silly dancing. Chris Wilson, Coast to Coast. Finished. ...arrests for drunkenness uh, and public order difficulties that were uh, obviously a, a current last night, that would have inflamed the situation. So. We're sandwiched between two main roads because the county council have decided to close the track that we normally use, which keeps us tucked away from the road and tucked away from the local population, where we're causing no one any problems. This track here is where the travellers say they would like to set up their camps. Both English Heritage and the police say that would pose no problems for them. The travellers certainly parked in the trackway for the past four or five years and I think it would be fair to say that English Heritage didn't have any problem with that at all. This time last year the travellers were allowed in and there was no trouble, but this time the council felt there was a risk to the public. If access is, is refused, as it will be I'm sure uh, during the summer solstice, then a confrontation is possible again, uh, particularly if they don't play it down and play it as low-key as we were last night. The travellers are urging the council to reconsider, otherwise both they and the police warn there'll be further violence. Keith Malone, coast to coast at Stonehenge. More than a thousand hippies and travellers have now left Stonehenge on Salisbury Plain following the violence which marred last night's spring equinox celebrations. Dozens of travellers were involved in scuffles with English Heritage security guards and stones and other missiles were thrown at police when others were asked to leave the area. Brooklyn Wiltshire police have been criticised for failing to attend a meeting aimed at avoiding trouble at this year's summer solstice. It was called by travellers who wanted all interested groups to discuss the problem. Some local residents came, but the police and local authority officials stayed away. David Sincock has this report. Stonehenge in the fresh winter sunshine. Today the monument looks unchanged down the centuries. But what local residents fear is a return to scenes like these in three months' time. Last night, leaders of the travellers determined to reach the monument in June called a public meeting in Salisbury. But the authorities stayed away. Wiltshire Police, the County Council and Salisbury District Council sent statements. Deputy Chief Constable Alan Elliott said it would not be appropriate for the police to speak. But the police aren't here. Why aren't they here? Here we are bending over backwards to, to try and get a negotiated solution to, to, to do something that would please everybody. 
Of the official bodies, the travellers see as their enemies. Only English heritage turned up for the meeting. I welcome any positive initiative of this kind um, because the Stonehenge summer solstice salute, um, problems would only be solved by discussion. Nonetheless, the authorities say the monument will not be open for the solstice. For the travellers, unrestricted access to the stones remains a distant dream. David Sincock, Coast to Coast. Well, when Mark Chapman shot John Lennon in 1980, Chapman was charged, convicted and imprisoned, and then largely forgotten. Now, Fenton Bressler is a criminologist and a barrister, and he has what seems to be quite an outrageous claim. It's his belief that Lennon's assassination was politically motivated, and that Mark Chapman was in fact employed by the CIA, who had planned and plotted Lennon's death for years and years. And Fenton is our studio guest tonight. Fenton, can you explain how you came to the conclusion that Lennon's assassination was in fact a politically motivated one? Well, the conclusion to which I come is, a su is subject always to the c final conclusion of my readers because I make it quite clear on page two uh, that uh, the view that it was a political assassination is a, is a possible theory. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the book, of page 297, I say, as we say in court, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the verdict is yours. But the scenario as it was put to me is this. Uh, that Lennon had in the early 70s been extremely active politically, more so than any, even than any person is today. Uh, like Sting or what's that man's name, Geldof, any of those. Uh, and it got him into trouble. Re um, Nixon had tried to get him out of the country, President Nixon. He had to fight for four years to stay, even in the United States, to stop deportation proceedings. And he got scared and he shut up. And he went off and became just one more uh, millionaire pop star and had a very nice time. But he got bored with it. And then by the time 1980 came, his five years as a house husband looking after his young son, Sean, and baking bread was over. In October, August 1980, he had uh, cut his first album for five years with Yoko Ono called Double Fantasy. In October 1980, he'd passed his 40th birthday, which is a climatic event in many people's lives, including mine, incidentally. And so there he was. He was becoming his, his old self again, looking forward to the future. He was also becoming politically interested again. The man was shot on Monday. That following Saturday, he was due to take part in a demonstration in the streets of San, uh, San Francisco uh, on the side of striking American workers. Now, I'm not saying for one moment that he was going to be President Gorbachev's grandson, but he was getting his act together <laughs> again. You know what I mean? He was becoming something like he was before. And yes. Reagan had been elected president the previous month. Nor am I saying that Reagan is behind the murder. And that's Balderdash. But there were people, extreme right-wing people, who took the view, or might have taken the view, uh, that Lenin was the one man in the United States of America who could bring a million people out in protest of the policies of the president-elect Ronald Reagan. Mm. Assuming this was the idea of the CIA, and they had to get rid of him because he was making too much noise again, um, surely it was a very dangerous thing to do. I mean, he was a very prominent man as a songwriter, wasn't he? Yeah, I know, but if you're, if, 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 by definition, you're paranoid if you're in the CIA anyway. By def but don't forget, they had 20 years researching into what they called behavioral modification. That is their term, not mine, behavioral modification. Uh, they are, on record, there were congressional inquiries which revealed that they have been responsible for political assassinations. I mean, you know, <laughs> if you're in that sort of business, you go for whoever you can. If they were behind the assassination of the president of, of Chile, they wouldn't stop at killing a pop star, for heaven's sake. Mm. All right, let's follow this theory through. Um, where did Chapman come in? What's his history? What do we know about him? Well, I mean, Chapman is a somewhat nebulous figure. So many of, of, of that kind of person is. He, he was born uh, in the Bible Belt of uh, southern United States, which is unbelievably fundamentalist Christian. I mean, in Memphis, for example, I was told uh, that the more churches than there are service stations. And so it is uh, we're with the, uh, the town of Atlanta where he was brought up. And he is not terribly happy as a child. His father loved him but couldn't show his affection. The mother was close to him. He goes to school. He's into all kinds of drugs by the age of 14. I mean, literally all kinds of drugs. He then is saved from that by his fundamentalist Christian belief. There's some uh, Bible-punching preacher who takes him away from it all. And he then wears a big cross and becomes a born-again Jesus lover or freak, whatever you want to say. Uh, he then gets involved, and rightly and properly so, in the YMCA. And I know it sounds bizarre, but the fact remains, in America there is some evidence to indicate that the CIA has infiltrated the YMCA. And so he 
ends up in 1975 in, of all places, Beirut. This penniless 20-year-old boy from the Bible Belt is in Beirut when the Civil War is breaking out. Why? An argument could well be he was being blooded because he was so impressed and so shattered by the violence he actually took back a cassette of the sounds of bombs and guns going off and people screaming and played it to people I interviewed in Atlanta. I mean, uh, there was no trial of the boy because God told him to plead guilty. But I wonder if some of these facts had come out in front of a jury, what they would have thought. Okay, we'll take a little break of okay. it. And uh, he's written a book about it. It's called The Murder of John Lennon. Details about that later on. As I remember, it was a case of insanity, wasn't it? A fan of Lennon. No, it wasn't. Ah, 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 ah. No, it wasn't. That, in, that again is something that's so bizarre. The defense of Jonathan Marks, his defense attorney, with whom I still play squash from time to time in New York, um, put forward was not guilty by reason of insanity, which is the defense we used to have in this country. We don't have it anymore. Now it's guilty by reason of insanity. It used to be not guilty by reason Sandy, until someone shot a Queen Victoria in the early 1880s and she was so offended that the thought that someone who tried to kill her should be not guilty, they changed the law. But in America, they didn't care all that much about Queen Victoria, they still got the old common law. So his defense was not guilty by reason of insanity. But then God comes and says, don't have a trial. So there ain't no trial and he gets sentenced as a sane man and he is now in a prison for sane people. Mm, so how thoroughly investigated were the circumstances that led up to the murder? Almost not at all. I mean, I, I found in retirement a very nice man called Arthur O'Connor, who was the lieutenant of detectives in that particular precinct, who interviewed um, Chapman on the night, and actually said to me, you know, he's, and I, my tape recorder was on the table, so I said, no, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not the gutter press. Uh, and uh, he said, you know, well, he, to me, he looked programmed. I know what use you're going to make of that work. I mean, but they were, I mean, he was banged to rights. The, the, you know, the guy stood there and waited for the police to come. They did inquire into his background to some extent, but there was no investigation of the mm. conspiracy. There was no investigation, really serious investigation of anything else. It was such a crude murder, wasn't it? I mean, one would expect something more carefully planned by the CIA, perhaps. No, not at all. Don't forget, you're in the country of hit killings par excellence. You're in the country, it was, I think, the 742nd shooting in the streets of New York that year. It's exactly what you would want. This is a, mur a murder in Budley Salterton. This is a murder, uh, you know, on West 72nd Street, <laughs> New York. Mm. Surely Chapman would not never have agreed to it. I mean, he would have known that it would have meant life in prison or even death. No, but he was programmed. If what I'm suggesting is right, the man was programmed. His mind was taken over. And in fact, he's actually said in a tape I've listened to, he heard and he hears in, so in his head a voice saying, do it, do it, do it. And one of the psychiatrists, not that I have all that great respect for psychiatrists, so one of the psychiatrists who saw him actually used the term, and this is significant, I think, David, actually used the term that they sounded to her like command hallucinations. Mm, that's very interesting. If you're right, Fenton, if this theory's right, what justice can be done? Oh, my dear boy, I'm a lawyer. Don't talk to me about justice. <laughs> so absolutely nothing can be done at all? Well, and I, no, I, one's, look, no I, one would recognize these slaves? Well, look, look, I tell you this. There have already been two reviews in this country that I've read. One was by, by a former police officer who says Balderdash. The other is... The, the, that at least the Sunday Times were fair. Everyone knows that John Stalker is an ex-police officer. The Sunday Telegraph runs a review uh, by a very distinguished man. Doesn't disclose to its readers that he was one of the uh, original founders, as I understand it, of the CIA. He also says border dash. Uh, the establishment always gathers unto its own. I don't know. Um, when the book is coming out in early March, uh, sorry, early September in the States. It'll be very interesting to see what the reaction of the Americans will be. It'll be very interesting to see what the New York City Police Department say to me when I'm in New York in early September. I'm not particularly looking forward to that visit, or to what happens when I get to Chicago, or whatever. Maybe we'll talk again in six months' time, David. Mm, perhaps so. And the book is The Murder of John Lennon and the Publisher of Fenton? It's published by Sidgwick and Jackson, and the flyleaf tells me it's £12.95. Sounds like very interesting reading. Fenton, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Said they defy police warnings to stay out of Wiltshire. The hippies say they're determined to hold a pop festival at the Stones, but police say they won't let it happen, as Nick Pennell now reports. 800 hippies have now gathered outside Bath, just a few miles from the Wiltshire border and only an hour from Stonehenge by road. This year, there won't be any mass invasion by peace convoys. The hippies say they'll split into small groups and avoid a direct clash with the police before the summer solstice. We have a free festival, you know. We're hoping to walk to Stonehenge. Walk you to know, Stonehenge? Peaceful, peaceful walk to Stonehenge. Do you think that'll be a, a big gathering this year? Yeah. Yeah, I hope so. That's right. <laughs> yeah. The last major confrontation two years ago ended with a dawn raid by police 
who evicted the hippies from their illegal campsite. A hundred were charged with obstruction and the convoy broken up. Last year, a small number were allowed to celebrate with the Druids if they had tickets. This year, English Heritage have issued a thousand tickets. Police say that's the maximum they'll allow into Stonehenge. They warn there is no land or site for a gathering. Any gathering will be regarded as an illegal act. The police say if they find any sizable group of hippies camping in the next 20 days leading up to the summer solstice, they'll evict them from the county. Nick Pennell, Coast to Coast, Wiltshire. Now, the lunchtime headlines from the newsroom of South today. Good afternoon. A group of hippies have issued writs against the Chief Constable of Wiltshire, Donald Smith, claiming damages totalling thousands of pounds. They're making allegations of assault, unlawful arrest and imprisonment, and damage to property. The writs all relate to an incident in June 1985 known as the Battle of the Beanfields when police were called to deal with 500 hippies on land off the A303 near Cholderton in Hampshire. Summonses are due to be issued through Andover County Court and it's expected to be at least a year before a hearing is held. From the newsroom of TVS, the lunchtime news for the South. Good afternoon. English Heritage say they'll fight new moves by a farmer to hold a midsummer festival on land next to Stonehenge. They're furious that solstice celebrations could be held on fields just yards from the stones. Dairy farmer Michael Evis from Somerset wants to buy a thousand acres on Salisbury Plain to stage a festival similar to the one he currently holds at Shepton Mallet. The last Stonehenge festival was held in the early 80s, but English Heritage banned it because of the damage to the site. Meanwhile, the Chief Constable of Wiltshire, Donald Smith, has been served with writs by 18 people in connection with the police operation against hippies three years ago. They allege assault and unlawful imprisonment. Wiltshire's chief constable has been served with writs following the confrontation with the Stonehenge hippies three years ago, which was nicknamed the Battle of the Beanfield. Donald Smith is being sued by people who allege damage to property, assault and unlawful imprisonment. He sent his officers to tackle a large group of hippies who gathered at Cholderton on the Wiltshire-Hampshire border. There were more than 500 arrests. Meanwhile, the Deputy Chief Constable of Hampshire, who's also been involved in moves against the hippies, today received the Queen's Police Medal. Deputy Chief Constable John Hodinot was among 13 people receiving awards from Hampshire's Lord Lieutenant for their service to the community. Mr Hodinot's medal was for work on the Brighton Bomb Inquiry and his part in an operation two years ago to move the hippie convoy out of the New Forest. The police mounted a dawn raid on the hippie camp at Stony Cross and the travellers were forced back onto the road. Uh, that was a particularly difficult time. Uh, it was all about uh, whether the law was going to be enforced properly. It was. It was also enforced very sympathetically. And times have changed. We have some new law now. It's a different problem. And it looks as though we are not facing the same difficulties of two years ago. I certainly hope not. We wouldn't like to go through that again. Mr Hodinot takes over as Hampshire's chief constable in September. Nigel Burwood, Coast to Coast. Now on BBC One, Bruce Parker and Sally Taylor present tonight's edition of South Today. The Battle of the Beanfield, now the hippies take the police to court claiming thousands of pounds in compensation. Hello, good evening. A full report on the latest round in that running battle in just a moment. Also... But first, a group of hippies involved in a violent clash with police near Stonehenge three years ago are to sue the Wiltshire Police Force. Lawyers acting for the hippies are issuing writs alleging assault, unlawful arrest, unlawful imprisonment and damage to property. They're claiming thousands of pounds worth of damages against the police. The legal action follows an incident in June 1985 which became known as the Battle of the Beanfield. The police were trying to stop a convoy of vehicles from reaching Stonehenge where the hippies were planning to hold an illegal pop festival. 
Roadblocks were set up at Cholderton, about six miles from the ancient monument, and officers tried to disperse the convoy. But the operation, which involved around 1,300 officers from seven different police forces, turned into a violent confrontation. Police wearing riot gear were brought in, and more than 500 hippies were arrested. Charges against them were later dropped. The operation was severely criticised by the Police Complaints Authority in a report published in March last year. But the Chief Constable of Wiltshire, Mr Donald Smith, defended his officers' actions. I think you must accept that they showed a high degree of courage and uh, I shall always be proud of the way in which the vast majority of those officers on duty acquitted themselves on that day. Well, Alan Lodge is one of those who've taken out a writ against the Chief Constable of Wiltshire. He's in our Bristol studio now. Why are you taking this action now? Um, I instructed my solicitor uh, three years ago, but it's taken this long through the legal, legal aid system. My solicitor is in Southwark, and I believe that's the longest list in the country. And so legal aid has been granted? It has now, yes. What precisely are the grounds for your own action, then? Um, your viewers will have just have seen footage of what occurred on the 1st of June 1985 at Childerton on the Hampshire-Wiltshire border. And they will know that uh, the police action, especially in front of TV cameras, was absolutely appalling. To actually be in the field that day and to see the charges and the, um, well, the riot that essentially took place was extremely frightening. The principle of minimum use of force is important, as well as the justification for the original arrests, and we believe they fail on both counts. Alan Lodge in Bristol, thank you very much indeed. Good evening. A hundred hippies banned yesterday from camping on woodland near Reading are preparing to march to Stonehenge. The hippies are tonight camped on wasteland at Silchester. Yesterday they tried unsuccessfully to move on to a nearby site they used last year for a festival. Police are at the scene, but so far there's been no trouble. The media are also watching the hippies' progress, and the hippies are keeping an eye on them too. Very disturbing story. Well, it's been a day of tense negotiations between police and several hundred hippies in the Thames Valley today. The hippies were moved off the site of a weekend pop festival at Silchester this morning. Now police say they want them to keep moving and stay off private land. Gareth Jones reports. Police moved in fast to round up the hippies on Berkshire's roads. Small convoys were stopped and prevented from regrouping after being moved on earlier in the day. Some camped at an old mill near Burfield, but they were told to get out. Outside the camp, roadblocks were set up to stop anyone else going in. Thames Valley Police launched a big operation to keep the travellers on the move after evicting them earlier from their unofficial festival site near Silchester. 600 of them were told to move after local residents complained about loud music. Uh, the very fact that uh, they are here is a sort of a nuisance value. Uh, it's a very quiet country road normally, and uh, to that effect, uh, I don't think they are an addition to anybody's peace of mind. My daughter um, told me that there was a group of hippies on the lawn here and they'd knocked on the door and said, could they have an ambulance because one of them had been beaten up. 